And let's just go right into it. The title of this message this morning is Congratulations, Faithful Word Baptist Church, Tucson. You know, I've been coming to this church now for, you know, the last six months. I come at the last Sunday of every month. And when you have a child and you see your child growing every day, you know, you see a significant growth, but, you know, it's not maybe as drastic to you. But an aunt or an uncle or a grandma or grandpa who doesn't see their child or that child growing as quickly, when they see them periodically, they see spikes of growth. And because I'm not here every Sunday and Thursday with you guys, when I do come, I do see significant growth, whether you see that or not. And it is a true blessing to see your guys' church flourishing. And, you know, within the time I've been here, you're in a new building, there's a new wall, the church is growing. And I just want you to know that you guys are on the right path of success to be a great church. You know, uh, FWBC Tucson next week is your guys' first year anniversary and we're not going to be here for that. You know, my wife and I are actually moving back to Hawaii here on September 14th and we really are going to miss you guys a lot. And because we're not going to be here, we're here to tell you your congratulations now. You know, buckle up for that Sunday. You're going to get another sermon of congratulations. But in Hawaii, first birthdays is a big thing. Someone who has a first birthday, I think it's in other cultures as well. It's just they throw a big luau and a big party for you guys. We brought some cupcakes for you guys to have after the service. And we just want you guys to know how appreciative it's been to be a part of this church's origins of its growth period. And, you know, let, let's just go right into it. Revelation 2, okay? We see in the book of Revelation 2, Jesus Christ talking to a bunch of specific different churches in Asia Minor <coughs> at that time. He has a lot of good things, he says, and bad things. And we're known at Faithful Word Baptist Church or in the NIFB movement to be known for hard preaching, dynamic preaching, um, doctrinal teaching. We're known to have a lot of different types of preaching ability, but this sermon is geared towards motivation to congratulate you guys. You know, it, a lot of people say, you guys are just hate preachers and you only preach on hate. And we do preach on hate. The Bible is two thirds, a lot of negative uh, uh, information. But there is that one third that is positive and it's to encourage, to strengthen one another, to press towards the mark of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus, to continue moving forward. And Jesus Christ is showing these churches the good things that they're doing first before he goes into the problems that he wants to point out. And if you look down at your Bible at a... Revelation 2, 2, we see the first word. I know thy works. Look at verse 9. It says, I know thy works. Look at verse 13. I know thy works. And look at verse 19. I know thy works. And then it goes into other positive uh, characteristics of each church. So ultimately, a good church in the eyes of God is the, wor the church that's doing the work of God. And you guys have been doing more work in this congregation than I've seen in congregations this size. Every time I come back and see that uh, map over there, though it's not completely folded up like Tempe, it's already starting to grow significantly more and more. You guys are making headway already in the first year being here in Tucson, and maybe Brother Fabian knows you've been here from the beginning, right? And you've seen the significant uh, growth in the soul winning map and the growth of the church. I don't know, you guys hit your uh, last attendance uh, quite a bit ago, but uh, maybe it'll hit it again this uh, next Sunday. And, you know, you guys are going to continue moving forward. And we do need to understand this, that congratulatory sermons, I'm here to just let you know, I'm here to lift you up, motivate you to keep serving God. Don't lose the first love. Don't lose the first works. Continue doing those works. You know, Proverbs 22 or 27, 2, you don't need to turn there, says, let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. I'm not a complete stranger. I know you guys, but the Bible is saying that another person uh, praise you. And I'm a big advocate of giving praise where praise is due. We do need to be cautious of people who are flatterers, over the top compliments of just like, you know, oh, you're so amazing. And they just want you to know that all the time. Right. Like I said, we should be giving praise where praise is due. I mean, if we watch or if you like have kids who play sports 
if they're playing basketball or football or soccer or something like that, and you see your kid make a shot, make a goal, don't you want to reward them and, and let them know, good job, you know, you see the world doing that for their uh, kids and their favorite teams. Why would we not do that for our brothers and sisters in Christ? We should give praise where praise is due. That means when you miss the shot, say good job. No, we don't give praise where praise isn't due. That's where flattery will come into play. You know, there's no participation reward in this church. You know, it's not like, oh, you tried. Good job. You know, I mean, it is good that we go out. We're not always going to win someone to the Lord, but our commandment is to go, yeah, to right. serve one another, to have fellowship with one another, to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and so on and so forth. So if we notice the world doing it for their favorite sports team, you know, this is the sport team of heaven that are doing great works of God. Yeah. And we need to always remember to give praise where praise is due. Sometimes, you know, people may get discouraged when they're not being praised. You know, I, I, I'm not saying to expect to be praised by your brother or sister in Christ. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't expect it, but when you get it, it is a blessing. I know people who have maybe done a lot. They get a lot of soul saved. They do a lot of extra Bible read. They're doing a lot for God, and they don't get accredited. People, we like acknowledgement. We like to know that people understand what we're going through. Now, God knows at the end of the day what you're going through, and we need to find comfort in that above anything, Amen. that Jesus Christ sees our works, our efforts, and what we are doing, and that should be enough. But when a brother or sister says, hey, I noticed you got that person saved. Hey, I noticed you started a new soul winning time. Or you did a good job leading in song or whatever. That's actually a great thing for someone to praise you in that. Amen. Don't expect it. But when you get it, be thankful. You don't need to be this jerk. And we heard a sermon not too long ago in uh, uh, the Tempe Church. I don't know if you guys heard it. Pastor Anderson explained how there's bad competition. If you're doing good, you don't want to like, you know, shove the person's face in it like yeah I'm amazing I did way better than most people uh, and if you don't have if you didn't see it go watch that sermon you know just be humble and accept your praise but what am I praising you guys for well number one is your quality I believe that this church faithful word Baptist Tucson is a very quality church and we can focus on the quality here because as of right now it's a little smaller and don't let anyone discourage you for being smaller don't yourself be discouraged because Bi the Bible teaches that God will build his church you know Jesus Christ right. tells Peter upon this rock I will build my church right. we don't build the church we go out and do the works we go out and do what is commanded of us but it is Jesus Christ who will build it as necessary and I believe that you, God does more with less. What do I mean by that? Well, turn, if you would, to Judges 7. A prime example of this is found in Judges 7. We all know the famous story of Gideon and the army of 300. And let's just take a look at what the Bible says in verse 1. It says, Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Horod so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them, by the hill of Moreh, in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for, for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. So let's pause there really quick. God is trying to tell Gideon that the people are too many, and we don't want them to vaunt themselves, right? Oh, that in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, lest any man should boast. It shouldn't be that we look at ourselves and our accomplishments and say, look at how great the church is because of what I did for the church and my soul winning time and my extra curricular activity that I did. You know what? It is God that built, we plant in water, but God gives that increase even within the church. And he says that I'm doing this so that Israel doesn't vaunt itself ultimately. But now look at verse 3. Now therefore go, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead, and there return of the people twenty and two 
thousand, and there remain ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, they shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not be with, or this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought them down, the people into the water, and the Lord sent unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lappeth will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go, and every man unto his own place. So like I was saying, you know, primary context of this story is ultimately God saying, I'm doing this for his glory. He's doing this so that the people of Israel and those outside of Israel would look at this event and say, oh, wow, look how great those 300 guys are. More so, he's saying so that they could say, look how great their God is. God is the one that wins the battle. He used David, what everyone thought to be a weak, younger, you know, teenager, young adult, ultimately, when they all looked at Goliath and they're like, oh, wow, what a great victory. But what did David said? I come to you in the name of the Lord. You come at me with spear, spear and shield, but I'm coming to you in the power of the Lord. You know, these people were doing the same thing. So the second application that I see in this passage is the quality of these 300 people. Because remember earlier, it says, those who are afraid, send them home. Because here's the thing, we are in a spiritual battle, and the battle is for the souls of men. And you guys are out in the highways and hedges and in the trenches fighting the Lord's battle, getting people saved. People are coming up here preaching. There's going to be a huge boom, I believe, in this church to continue moving forward and doing great battles for the Lord. And if the church grows <coughs> to two, three hundred, four hundred, or it stays the same, God gets the glory in and of it all. Because the quality of the people here is what it, no one here is afraid. And if you do have fear, you ask God to get that fear out of here. God never gave us the spirit of fear, but of power and of strength. Amen. So turn, if you would, to Philippians 2. So that's the first thing I want you guys to be praised for is your quality. You guys are very cream of the crop, I believe. I've been here enough to get to know you guys, to fellowship, and I really know that you know you guys are some of my close friends and i really like you know soul winning with you guys it's a very fun experience for me and i see a great quality in you but what's another thing i want you guys to be known or you to know is about your unity you guys are very united you guys are very close-knit and i think that's a very great skill to have in the church you know a lot of people unfortunately lose this unity aspect and a lot of the time we see in the epistles the importance of unifying together why why do we unify or how how do we unify together ultimately well in philippians 2 it explains oh i went to the wrong place in philippians 2 the bible reads in verse 2 Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So how do we become unified? We esteem other better than ourselves. Do unto others as you should do unto you, as Jesus said. This mind that is in Christ should also be in us, that we should be learning to serve one another. If the Son of God, the Savior of the world, can come down and wash the feet of the disciple, we cannot think that we're, too be we're better than that. Amen. We're not better than our Lord. We should be sufficient to be as our Lord, so right. to say. Right. Serve one another in this way. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. You know, I know that as this church grows, you guys are going to have do a lot more things. You're going to want to uh, do more events or uh, have more soul winning times. And, you know, if, if you see someone 
doing more and becoming a great Christian, you know, praise him for that. Don't get envious. Don't be striving about that. Don't, you know, you should covet the best gifts. But when you see a brother and sister in Christ being exalted, you should be happy about that. You should be content with where you are and see them and be in the same mind as them and say, praise the Lord in and of it all. But here's an example I want to show you about the strength of unity. You want to volunteer? Sure. You don't have to. <laughs> come, come on up. This pencil, you, you feel like you could break this pencil, right? Go ahead, break the pencil. Oh, you got this. Boom, okay. Round of applause. That's good. Strong guy. Now wait, before you leave, right? That was just one pencil. Put those two together. Now try to break it. You're not going to break that thing, are you? The concept that I'm trying to help you, thank you. You can sit down. I just wanted everyone to see that. You know, where two or more are gathered together, there am I in the midst of you. Amen. You know, the Bible teaches that one Christian is only so strong. And look, he had to apply a lot of pressure to break the pencil, right? It wasn't like it was just like, oh, that was easy. Kind of took a little bit of pressure. And Jesus, or yeah, Jesus Christ said this to Peter. You know, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know, when you guys are unified together, you cannot be broken. Nothing, I mean, I can't do it either, so nothing will break you. You guys are unified in the front of serving God. So turn, if you would, to Ephesians 4. Okay, I get it. We, how do we become unified? We get unified by becoming in the like mind. Well, what do we think of? What, what is our like mind? What do we think on? What are the things that we uh, put our mind to? Well, Ephesians 4, 1 and 6 tell us. If you would, take a look down at your Bible. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness of me and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who was above all and through all and in you all. So what are we unified around? We're, unif we're, unif we're unified around faith alone in the King James Bible. We don't sit here and contemplate the other Bible versions. Right. We don't sit here and think, could those manuscripts that we hear of that have came later on, could they be? God's word, we don't ever, we've made our bet on it. We unified and said, this is the final authority for all faith and practice. The King James Version of the Bible. We're unified on the Trinity, Amen. the orthodox view of the Trinity. What we have always known to be true, that three persons, one God understanding of God. It says one God, one Father of all, and one Spirit. So also we're unified in faith, like faith alone, and Amen. baptism immersion we are unified in doctrine this is how we become unified is through what we believe well how do you know what to believe you know the same anointing that is in me is in you and you not need that any man teach you but don't we have preachers and teachers and evangelists and deacons and leaders to help perfect the saints right. take a look down at your bible it says that in verse 11 it says and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ till we all come together or come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ so like i said how do we get unified we get all on the same page Okay, what page? The Bible, King James Version of the Bible. Faith alone in that Bible. Got it. But I want to know more. We need to unify around our elders, our spiritual leaders. And like I was saying earlier, you know, Brother Corbin Russell, our deacon, is a very great man. And you guys really at times need to find yourselves praying for Corbin Russell. He has been significantly, you know, 
he works a lot harder than maybe we ever know. And, he, you know, with being sick and driving down here three times a week and, and throwing events, it's, it's not easier said than done. And it is a true blessing that Brother Corbin Russell can take this church upon himself. And we need to pray for him so that he, you know, him and his family are safe, that he has boldness to preach right. the word of God. And then our, our pastor, Pastor Stephen Anderson of our church, you know, we need to pray for him that his family is safe and that he, you know, tries not to get sick and, and right. things like that, that he continues helping us move forward because these are our spiritual leaders and they are designed as pastors. And the word pastor is synonymous with like, you know, like a, uh, that would pastor a sheep, you know, like a shepherd. So they're trying to guide us into doing the right things. We have our own understandings, but they have studied the show themselves approve. So because of that, we need to unite around them and stand up with them when the church gets attacked, when the movement gets attacked, when they get attacked. We need to stand up with them and let them know how we are in agreement with them. You know, God forbid that you know, long time ago when that whole Orlando shooting went down, when Verity lost a lot of its members, you know, similar to what we just saw in the story of Gideon, if you're fearful, go. We don't want you. It's better to have a quality crew that is united on the front on the sodomite issue, on the sons of the devil and on the attacks of the world, on us and on Christianity. We need to stand strong on these things. Amen. Follow our leaders. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So let's do the same. So I'm here to congratulate you on your quality. I'm here to congratulate you on your unity. Praise the Lord. Amen. But this is the flip side to this coin. You know, we need to watch out. And turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians. What do you mean, watch out? Well, a basketball game that we were talking about earlier, if we see the world, you know, doing a lot of these extracurricular activities and they're winning games and they're doing this stuff, say it comes halftime and they're winning. Hey, good shot, good pass, good play, good game. You guys are doing great. So stop, let up, slow down. No, the coach always, that's the point where you tell them, don't let up, keep moving forward. You need to be careful because now is the time when you're doing good that you're gonna become a target. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now that you might, if you're doing great things and you're making shots, making pass, making assists, making plays, making things happen, you don't think the enemy sees that as well? You don't think you have a target on your back to let you know? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, if you would turn there, verse 12, it reads, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with the temptation also maketh the way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Be careful. Take heed lest ye fall. Understand this. You guys are doing great. The church is making moves, making strides, getting people saved. But you guys need to stay unified and pray one another for one another. You know, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you guys are united on your fellowship after church, on your soul winning and things like that, then it won't be likely that you can be destroyed. Because if the gates of hell won't prevail against the church, how could the church ever get destroyed? Because God's the one that builds us, right? The way... Satan destroys the church is from within the church. Nothing can stop outside forces, the world. That, that we, yeah, we are conquerors above them. Amen. It's from within the walls of the church, inside of the hearts of people, how this church can be destroyed. And I'm just letting you know, the Bible teaches that the, our adversary, the devil, is as a lion, seeking whom he may devour. Seeking for what? Does the lion seek for the top dog? Does he look for the alpha male? No, he's looking for that straggler on the side. He's looking for the chink in the armor. He's looking for the weak spot. And once he finds that weak spot, then he's going to try to jump on it. And I'm not going to sit here and say we're all this mature, great, amazing Christians, but we need to keep our hearts right and stay in the quality and in the first loves and loving one another as Christ has loved us. Amen. And, you know, 
A good example of this in a, in a secular understanding is the, the story of Troy. Or the, have you ever heard of the Trojan horse? The horse? Well, ultimately, if, for those who haven't heard, there was a city a long time ago, in, I think it was Greece, it's called Troy, and uh, the, the, the Trojan horse is the way that army destroyed Troy. They, they made a big idol of a horse as a, as a gift, like, oh, we give up, we throw up the white flag, we don't want to fight anymore, here's a, a reward. And inside this horse was a bunch of army, or was a bunch of, a bunch of people. The walls of Troy were impenetrable. No, they could not get into the walls of that city. So when they put the horse in the city with those guards in there, they were able to destroy the whole entire city in one night. And just like that, that's how a church would be destroyed. And I'm not saying it could happen in one night, but that's what these preachers and teachers are uh, here to do. They're to be vigilant and to look out for wolves that are in sheep's clothing and things like that. A uh, way I can explain this in a analogy would be with a soda can. I don't know if you guys have ever like seen the trick with the soda can, but if you can imagine this is like a church and you know I were to represent the world or things that would ultimately come against it, but no matter how much pressure I put on this can, if you can't see, it won't bridge. The can isn't that strong, as a matter of fact, especially if you take the aluminum. Aluminum is a weaker metal. But if I were to go and put even all my weight on it, it would break, of course. But ultimately, it would hold me up. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Apparently, if you have a can and you put a bunch of pressure on it, it can endure a lot of weight. The only way this can would go was ultimately if you put a chink on the side and then the whole thing would crush. So that's the thing I was trying to explain, but I failed in my analogy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's just it. Proverbs 6. Turn if you would there. What do we got to watch out in our hearts for? Okay, we can only be destroyed from within. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Judas is, that'll be among us. And mind you, they will be among you. Even in a crowd like this, even though it's not the biggest church, there could be wolves even in here. I'm not saying that there is one. That's why they're in sheep's clothing. They're very uh, convincing. They can convince others that they're believers in Christ. Judas was convinced to be a believer in Christ, but he was a devil from the beginning. Jesus knew that. But in Proverbs uh, 6, where I had you turn, verse 16, you that are saved, the way you would destroy yourself is found right here in verse 16. The Bible reads, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to run to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. If you become proud in your heart, God can easily remove the candlestick out of this church. You know, in Revelation 2, where we had you start, remember there's good attributes right off, right off the bat. I know your works and all these other things that I like about you, but these are the things I don't like about you. And in verse 5, it talks about um, I forget which the church was, but he says, if you do this, I will remove your candlestick from you. You think it's Satan that is the one destroying the church? God allows Satan to de destroy the church. Satan only has power that God gives him. If we're not faithful and we're not doing the right thing, God is the one that sees that and knows what we're doing. And he'll allow Satan to creep in. He'll allow the wolves in sheep's clothing to creep in. He'll let your hearts become, you know, more proud and lifted up. And he says, okay. Let's see how that works for you. And feet that be sh uh, swift to, uh, and, uh, and he that so at this court among the brethren, and feet that be swift to run to mischief. Those who are ready to go around and be tittle, uh, tattlers and busybodies and spread rumors and things like that, that's how this church will be destroyed. You need to love one another, forgive each other's faults, because look, I am, come from a family of six. I love my brothers and sisters, but do brothers and sisters get along all the time? I mean, come on. It, it, well, I had a saying I had a lot growing up, I love how much I hate them, but I hate how much I love them. Because you, your brothers duke it out, boys will be boys, but you love them, you know what I mean? And even within the church, 
understand this, you're not just going to always get along and agree with everyone and everything all the time. But we need to look past each other's faults and understand that I'm to love you as Christ loved me. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we should do that the same thing. And here's the last uh, thoughts that I want to leave you on. Um, turn, if you would, to James. Not here to leave you on a bad note. You guys, it's, it, it's congratulations. Good job. You know, Jesus says to the man who was given the talent and then returned more talents, he said, well done, now get a faithful servant. Right. You know, angels in heaven rejoice when we see someone get saved, or when they see someone get saved. Right. We should do the same. When we see someone get saved, it's like, right on. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, a brother and sister in Christ got a sin out of their life. You know, someone got married, someone had a child, right. someone is growing in their faith. And that's like, we should just know that congratulate. there's nothing wrong with congratulating one another. It should not be all the time. Give praise where praise is due. If there's no due praise, don't praise them. Oh, you, you tried. You did decent. You know, no, don't, don't, just give praise where praise is due. But how can all this come together is by staying humble. We stay little in our own sight as Saul started out, the King Saul, he started out little in his own sight and then he was lifted up in pride. Because of that, God says, I repented that I made him king and then he rather gave it to a man after God's own heart, David. David stayed humble in and of it all. He loved his enemy, Saul, who was trying to kill him. Why? Because his works were good and his evil. You know, Saul didn't obey the Lord. And David didn't always obey the Lord, but he had a right heart. He repented when he went into gross sin. You know, he did a very horrible, wicked thing. But ultimately, he had his heart right. And God understands that. And he was punished for what he did by the death of his child. But he stayed humble in and all of his all. And you guys got to understand, we got to stay humble. And that's how... The quality will stay there. The unity will stay there. And we can s avoid these traps of the devil. But in James 4, the Bible reads in verse 5, Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So we need to understand that to not lift ourselves up in pride, as we saw in Proverbs 6, that's the thing that will help destroy us. Stay low in our own sight when these good things happen. When someone praises you, don't be like, yeah, that's right, I'm great. Uh, yeah, I got that guy saved. I'm amazing. You know, it's like, whoa, okay, you just kind of defeated your own. It's kind of like someone who fasts and then they go tell people they fast. They're like, oh, I'm fasting. It's like you kind of just lost the whole point of fasting there. You should have just said nothing and then you'd have been fine. But, you know, to each their own, right? And, and the fervent prayer of a righteous man will avail much. If, if a brother or sister in Christ, if you see in here, starts getting lifted up in pride, I believe we should, it's not our job to tell them what to do, but to just point it out, be like, hey, brother, you did good. Oh, yeah, I know I'm great. Be like, yeah, that's a pretty proud thing to say. I'm just letting you know you're, you're doing great, you know. And, and Lord willing, we will understand that as, as uh, constructive criticism, I'm not perfect. I know I, I, I can be lifted up in pride. I need to take heedless. I can fall. We can all fall. Right. All, Corbin, Pastor Anderson, all of us, we are all sinful men. None of us are too good. None of us are just, as some stupid people preach, are without sin once right. we're saved. We don't believe in sinless perfection. But the Bible continues reading, and it says in verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Amen. We need to stay humble. And notice what it says. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Don't think that just because you may see a brother lifted up in pride or something that you are without sin. You know, we need to keep, keep ourselves in check, pray for one another, and in doing this, we will stay humble. But turn, if you would, to uh, Philippians 4, and we'll end here. Philippi I'm sorry, Philippians 3, verse 14. 
The Bible says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto him. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same things. I don't know if you noticed, but in these two verses, it said mind three times. Let us mind the same things. I'm not going to be seeing you guys much longer. And I know me and my wife are very happy every end of the month to come to this church. We really like the fellowship. We really like the quality. We really like the unity. We really like you guys all here for one another. You fellowship and, and, and the work is moving forward and it's a great thing. You know, I want you to know you guys are doing a great job. And if you don't mind, give yourselves a round of applause. You know, just tell, tell yourselves, look, think about it. A year ago, this church wasn't even here. Right. So now you guys have a great, soul-winning, fired-up church to go to. And you have each other to be there for. Amen. You know, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, especially as we see the days approaching. Stay humble, and we will continue doing great things. And I just want you guys to know, you guys are good in the eyes of the Lord. Spire heads and have a word of prayer.